I'm just zooming through the videos here to get through lesson 11, but I'm sure you guys are taking lots of time to get through the math problems. So um, carry on with that. Send me questions if you have any as you go along. This will conclude this lesson. Let's move away from the math for just a minute before we come back to it. No conversation about conductor sizing would be complete without talking about the American wire gauge. So AWG, the American wire gauge, is how we express the size of a conductor. So I already listed diameter and square mill area and circular mill area. Um, in normal everyday conversations, we don't touch on any of those values. We use the American wire gauge, also known as the Brown and Sharp wire gauge, although I've never heard anyone refer to it as that. It's used in the United States and other countries, and so we have adapted it as well, or adopted it rather. Um, there are 40 sizes within the American wire gauge, uh, ranging from 40 gauge all the way up to one. Now, it's a little bit awkward, and I don't know why they've done this, but the bigger number represents a smaller wire, okay? So 40 gauge wire is itty bitty little wire. I have no idea what it would be used for or where. Um, even the small strands of your telephone wire are probably, I don't know, about 18 or 22, okay? 14 or 40 rather is just an insanely tiny little wire, okay? Uh, increasing in size all the way up to number one, okay? Um, and now we're talking about conductors that are approaching, I don't know, a half inch in diameter, maybe. Actually, we'll look at the table when we get there. Um, typical wire in your house is 14 gauge uh, or possibly 12 gauge. That's a, a, a typical size. Uh, when you get up to a wire the size of number one, we're almost big enough for service conductors. Once you get bigger than number one American wire gauge size wire, we have four sizes that are referred to as aughts, okay? Uh, and they are expressed just like this. You've got one aught. So there's two different ways that you might write that. So that's one aught, or that's a different way of showing one aught with a single zero, okay? Two aught, or two zeros, three aught, Okay, showing as three zeros, we still say three aught and four aught. Okay, now these are typical sizes for your standard residential service. Okay, um, four aught is the size that we use for a 200 amp service, for example. Okay, so these aren't American wire gauge sizes per se, um, they're kind of all by themselves one aught, two aught, three aught, and four aught. Once you get to conductors bigger than four aught, now we actually use circular mill area. Okay, so beyond four aught, we talk about conductors. The next size up from four aught is 250 kc mill. Okay, so once we get beyond four aught, we use kc mill or MCM. Okay, so beyond four aught is 250, and then 300, 350. 450, 500, 750, 1000 KC mill or MCM. Okay, so, so this is more traditionally, more typically, how we talk in everyday conversations about the size of wires. Okay, here's the table. This is really fine print, but there it is. So if we look at this, now notice I said we talk about everything in inches. Okay, each one of these shows us a metric, a millimeter version as well. Okay but we are going to pretty much just ignore that. Um, so if we look at, oh, this includes the aughts as well. Oh, good. So if we look at one gauge, for example, uh, let me see, what do I want to look at here? The diameter is 0.2893. So let's see, is everybody looking where I'm looking? So number one gauge conductor is, a little bit bigger than a quarter inch in diameter, okay? Um, which means if we look over here at the KC mill, 
we could actually do the math and calculate that. 0.2893 squared would be, I suppose, 83,000, which translates to 83.7 kc mills. Notice that this is kc mills. Okay. Now, there's also conversation over here about resistance, copper resistance, and we will get to that later on. We'll come back and look at this table when we get there to figure out what this final column is all about. Okay. Uh, lots of detail there, none of which is really test material, although as you continue to crunch the numbers, you will see how these numbers all work out. Okay. The, the, we could calculate all of these, but the table is here to give us the information. Okay, let's move on. That's the conversation about American wire gauge. Back to the math. Okay, now, the next um, page, so page three, page C of your handout, now gets us into doing work with strands. Okay, so we've dealt with the solid conductor. We've done all that work. Well, what happens if it's stranded conductor? And it's really the same thing. We just have to multiply it by the number of strands. But... Uh, the thing that I want to highlight for you is that the order of operation is very important, okay? So it's absolutely vital that if you are given a question that tells you the diameter of a strand and your task is to figure out the circular mill area of the entire conductor, okay, step one must be, so first calculate the circular mill area of a single strand. Okay, so if you're told the diameter of a strand, square that to get your circular area of that strand, and then you just multiply that multiply it by the number of strands. Okay, so each individual strand has a particular circular mill area, multiply it by how many strands, and now you've got the circular mill area of the entire conductor. Okay, it's really, really necessary, really important to do it in that order. Let's do an example and, and see what this looks like. Okay, I don't know why that came up last. Let's try this again. All right, so here it is. Example, find the circular mill area of a stranded conductor if each strand has a diameter of 100 mils and there are seven strands. So here's the process. What is the circular mill area per strand? Simply d squared. So 100 mils squared gives you 10,000 circular mils. And then we simply multiply that by the seven conductors, sorry, the seven strands of the conductor, and 70,000 circular mils is your final answer. Just for comparison, look at what happens if you do this wrong. So if you did it the other way around, if you said, well, I know the diameter of the conductor, I was told that 100 mils, I know the diameter of the conductor, sorry, I, I want to find the diameter of the conductor and it equals the diameter of the strand, that's what I was told, times the seven strands. Well, that should be 700 mils. Now let's use that as my diameter and calculate the area of the conductor. So now the diameter of the conductor, what I think it is, what I just calculated it to be, which is 700 squared, gives us an answer of 490,000 circular mils, 490 kc mils, as opposed to the right answer, which is only 70. Okay, so this number is really, really wrong. Why? Well, here's the deal. Here is a strand. Okay, we were told the diameter of that strand is 100 mils. If we chose to calculate the diameter of the conductor by taking the diameter per strand, and multiplying it by seven, wow. That would be the equivalent of doing this. Here's our seven strands. One, two, three, four, oof, five, six, seven. That's ugly. And there is our diameter of 700 mils. Okay, now when we calculate the area, what we're actually calculating is the area of, and assume that's round, of course it's not even close, but that's what we just calculated. Okay, that's that 490,000. 
okay, which you can see is clearly the wrong answer, okay? So I made a real mess of this slide, but I've managed to strike out just about all of this work down here, which is good because it's all wrong. Cross all this out. Incorrect process. All right, don't do it that way. Make sure you get your order of operation correct when calculating the circular mill area of a stranded conductor, okay? The remainder of these slides, and I know that uh, when I go to export this, it'll give you the rest of the slides, so I might as well just go through them and talk about them quickly. The rest of these slides are just examples from the um, exercise sheet. So question one, here's an opportunity for you to see the solution, okay? Um, and, and I will answer questions if necessary as we go through, but this is the step-by-step -step process to do the math uh, for question one. And then question three, there's a reason that I'm going through this, guys. I, I don't want to do all this work for you. I do want you to spend some time trying to do it yourself. Um, come back here by all means look at the PowerPoint. I'm hoping you're printing these off from Blackboard as you go. And, uh, and that helps you if, if, you, if you need a point in the right direction. <clears throat> Here's an interesting conversation though. Question four may cause you to make a mistake. Okay. Um, <clears throat> translating from mils to inches when using area. So this lesson began with a conversation about the fact that translating, translating from inches to mils meant multiplying by a thousand, right? Which means move the decimal place three times to the right, okay? <clears throat> this question four in the exercise sheet actually leads you to a point where you want to translate from inches squared to mil squared. <clears throat> and you can't do that by multiplying by a thousand, all right? You're not just moving the decimal place three times because when translating from squared to squared, your translation is not multiplied by a thousand, but multiplied by a thousand square, which means now in this instance, you must move the decimal place six times, okay? When you're doing your from inches to mils translation, because your translation is actually inches squared to mil squared, so watch it for that. Okay, um, beyond that, there's a conversation here about question five as well. Oh yeah, because there's actually, there's two possible solutions. So here's one process. And again, I don't wanna talk through this. I want you guys to try and find your way from start to finish. There's one possible way of solving for question five. An alternate solution is coming at it from a different angle, okay? And I really want you guys to find your own solution without really